Hello, everybody. So we're continuing hormones, homeostasis, and reproduction with subtopic 6.6. .6. Last time I left off with felp popo. So we talked about what happens if there is a fertilized egg that's implanted in the uterine lining. We talked about what happens if there isn't an a embryo or a fertilized egg that's developing in the uterine lining. So when there is not a fertilized egg implanted into the uterine lining, the progesterone levels are going to decrease. We were saying that progesterone does what? It thickens and maintains the uterine lining. So something that I forgot to mention is when the progesterone levels drop drastically and before we have FSH production again, something else has to happen. And that would be the uterine lining actually ends up being shed. Why does it end up being shed? Because again, it's not being maintained by the progesterone and we also need to refresh or sort of restart um, the uterine lining so that it's going to be ready and prepared and sort of new for in case there is a fertilized egg that does end up being implanted. So kind of a cool um, cartoon here talking about the ovarian cycle. Okay, so what's happening in the ovaries here, but also the uterine cycle, what's happening with the uterus. Okay, we've got the FSH being produced by what? By the pituitary. Remember, felpopo, FSH being produced by the pituitary. It's going to be developing the follicle, right? Because it's the follicle stimulating hormone and it develops it and the follicle starts producing estrogen. And you can see the follicle here that contains the eggs producing estrogen. Then we have what hormone right here, right? And remember, estrogen is produced in the ovaries, right? By the follicle. Which hormone is right here? LH, right? So LH is produced again by that pituitary. And what is the LH doing? It's smacking the follicle. And what comes out of the follicle is the egg. What do we call this when the egg is released from the follicle? We call it ovulation, right? And then we have something that formed here. Do you remember the luteinizing hormone after ovulation occurs? It causes the corpus luteum to form and develop. And the corpus luteum is what produces the progesterone, right? And the corpus luteum is in the ovary, right? Producing the progesterone and maintaining that uterine lining. It's possible that you could be asked about the negative and positive feedback mechanisms involved in ovarian and pituitary hormones. So if you want to practice those negative and positive feedbacks that I was talking about, remember, Positive feedback is going to be if a hormone increases its own production or it causes a, the production of another hormone, then that's positive feedback. Anytime you have a decrease in the production or stopping of a production of a hormone as a result of the production of another hormone or molecule, which would be inhibition, right, then that's going to be negative feedback. Negative feedback is always keeping things in balance, right? Okay, so if you want to practice that, just pause here. And then I'm going to put the mark scheme for this question on the next slide. Explain the roles of specific hormones in the menstrual cycle, including positive and negative feedback cycles. And here we have the mark scheme over here, so you can check your answer. It was eight marks, so remember if it's eight marks, you do have to make eight of those points, at least eight of those points. The last part of 6.6 .6 is talking about a technique called IVF, or in vitro fertilization. So this is a technique that's used to overcome infertility in females and sometimes this can be caused by blocked fallopian tubes. So if you could imagine if the fallopian tubes are blocked, so for example if we're looking over here, if the fallopian tubes are blocked then what's not going to be able to happen, right? The, the egg that is ovulated from the ovary, it's not going to be able to travel through the fallopian tube and to get fertilized and be implanted so the female is not going to be able to get pregnant. So IVF again is a technique to overcome infertility. Okay, Other causes of infertility could be ova not maturing or being released. There could be abnormality in the uterus itself that prevents the egg from being implanted. Um, there might even be antibodies in uh, the female reproductive organs in the mucus that prevents and attacks the sperm that comes in, okay? 
There can be causes of male infertility, well, like unable to achieve erection or normal ejaculation, uh, low sperm count, so not producing enough sperm, or maybe the sperm are abnormal and can't swim or move properly. Men can also maybe have a bla blocked vas deferens, so that would be where the tube that carries the sperm would be blocked and doesn't allow the sperm to even swim through it. The statement for this is the use of IVF drugs to suspend the normal secretion of hormones followed by the use of artificial doses of hormones to induce superovulation and establish a pregnancy. So the first thing that has to be done is downregulation. So we stop secretion of pituitary and ovarian hormones. Why do we do this? It just helps to control the whole process of pregnancy and control the hormones so that it can be more successful and more in control. Next, we have superovulation. So this is when high doses of FSH and LH, right, which is going to cause ovulation of the eggs, the high doses of FSH and LH are actually used and injected over 10 days to stimulate development of multiple follicles, so not just one, but multiple, and those are going to be, the eggs are actually going to be collected from the ovaries. Okay, so once we have the collected eggs, you're go and they've been removed from the follicles, you're going to combine them with sperm in the lab, like in a petri dish, right? Okay, so then you take the sperm and combine them with the eggs so that they are now fertilized eggs. Essentially, we're fertilizing the female and male gametes in the lab just to ensure a successful fertilization of egg and sperm. Then, once we have these fertilized eggs, uh, you actually take those fertilized eggs and re-implant them back into the uterus. Something interesting about this is that sometimes the females really, really want to make sure that they're going to have a pregnancy and that it's going to be successful and that the fertilized egg actually does get implanted in the uterine lining and starts the formation of an embryo and a baby and causes a pregnancy. So the females, sometimes they will implant two or three fertilized eggs into the endometrium or uterine lining in order to make sure that they're going to get pregnant. And this is why sometimes when people go through this process of IVF, they actually end up having a pregnancy multiple births, maybe two or three babies. Okay, so another hormone that you need to know that's involved with all this, remember, progesterone does maintain that uterine lining, and that is needed for a successful pregnancy. So the female who has the eggs implanted back inside of her also has to be taking progesterone for weeks to make sure that that uterine lining is maintained and ready to support a developing embryo. As an overview, we're collecting the eggs from the ovaries, right? And this was after FSH and LH were given to stimulate superovulation, okay? Eggs are collected. Eggs are then fertilized in the lab, right? In a petri dish or a test tube with the sperm, okay? Then we're going to re-implant those embryos into the female, into her uterus, okay? Three embryos could be implanted at a time to ensure pregnancy, okay? And also, don't forget that progesterone is also administered to maintain that uterine lining. The last statement in 6.6 .6 is about this scientist named William Harvey, okay? He investigated sexual reproduction in deer. So what he was trying to investigate was whether or not this idea from Aristotle, all the way back from Aristotle, was true. So Aristotle had this theory of seed and soil. He had a theory that the male produces a seed which forms an egg when mixed with menstrual, menstrual blood. Okay, then the egg would develop into the fetus inside of the mother. So Harvey decided to study reprodu reproduction in deer. So he dissected female deer after mating to observe changes in sexual organs, but he found that there were no changes. So he came to this understanding that menstrual blood did not contribute to the formation of a fetus, and this was proven true. Okay, so he disproved Aristotle's theory, 
And then he also did question the direct role of semen or sperm in the reproduction. Now that idea was proven false. And something to keep in mind about this is that he had some difficulties with his studies because he didn't have microscopes, right? Which were invented 17 years after his death. death. So he wasn't able to observe gametes like sperm and eggs and fertilized eggs and embryos as well. He couldn't observe any of that because he did not have uh, microscopes yet. So this sort of relates to nature of science and TOK that, uh, that you can only do the research after there's improvements in the apparatus.